Welcome back to another episode of Rewiring Health. Very honored to be joined by Kristen Jacobson. So thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I, we, I were just talking about, I was saying what drew me to you is the, you know, how much you talk about perfectionism, the high achieving, um, the high functioning anxiety. And mm -hmm. there are so many aspects that especially women, I think live with that we don't even realize we're living with and that are under the surface, but in impact so much of our life. And what Absolutely. brought you to serving people who struggle with these things? I mean, I, I have, personal lived experience with it. And then being a clinician, you know, um, working with clients who are also struggling with this. So um, I've, I've had anxiety myself pretty much my entire life. And then um, in adulthood, it really started manifesting in that high functioning anxiety, sort of high achieving way. Um, and almost like over-functioning, I, I like to think about it. So just have had to be really um, intentional myself about knowing when to, to stop doing things and really, you know, having um, pretty firm boundaries between work and my personal life and um, and just helping my clients to, to navigate that for themselves too. And um, like you mentioned, just we carry a lot of, of limiting beliefs and, and certain expectations. And we don't really, um, re reflect on those a lot. And so that's what I work on a lot with my clients is kind of getting in touch with their core values so that they can live a more intentional life that's aligned with those. Yeah. I love that. And as far as your own journey, what really allowed you to release yourself from some of these things that were holding you back? Um, you know, I, I still struggle with it and I still yeah, have I to be <laughs> to, to remind myself to practice what I preach a lot mm -hmm. of the time. But I think, um, for me, exercise has been, um, really helpful just in terms of kind of releasing stress and, um, being able to practice mindfulness in my own way. You know, a, a lot of people, well, a lot of the, the clients I, I work with tend to sort of resist the idea of meditation because, you know, we're constantly in that, that like hustle culture, go, go, go type of state. And so it's like, wait, I don't have time to meditate. I don't have time to, to slow down, but I think it's important to realize that practicing mindfulness can, can look a, a lot of different ways, you know, and it's really just kind of being immersed in the present moment and really being in, intentional with what you're doing. And so, um, and getting out of your head <laughs> essentially. <laughs> So yeah. for me, exercise has really helped and just, um, trying to practice mindfulness in, in other areas mm -hmm. of, of my life and just kind yeah. of my day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's so important. Just that slowing down. Like I know for me, even too, that's been a big part. Cause it was like that almost staying busy feels more natural, Absolutely. When yeah. especially when you are a high achiever, you're always going, it's like, that feels more comfortable. So slowing down can be really challenging. Did you feel mm -hmm. like you very intentional about that, especially when you started? Yeah. And I, I literally will schedule it into my day, mm -hmm. like an appointment, you know, because yeah. otherwise it's, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, you know, making an appointment with yourself is a, a tremendous act of self-respect and self-care mm -hmm. just to, to kind of honor that. And a, yeah. most people do not do that, you know, yeah. if they have yeah. sort of somebody external, they're accountable to that's fine, but they, yeah. they have a really hard time being accountable to themselves. It's so true. It almost feels like we're almost on autopilot most of our days, you know, you just yeah. trying to get everything done, check the boxes and then do it all over again. Absolutely. And yeah. I love how you talk about, um, you know, I've, I've watched a lot of your social media posts and like, you talk about the high functioning anxiety. And I know when I came across that term years ago, I was like, Oh my gosh, that's me. Like, you know, yeah. I never really heard that term before. Cause I didn't really consider myself to be anxious. Cause I'm like, well, I'm still doing everything I need to do. But when like, when yeah. I term I'm like wow like you know this this literally described how I felt do you mind talking on that a little bit more like what is high functioning anxiety what are the signs of it what are what do people feel like when they're experiencing that yeah so I I think a lot of people are are similar in the sense that they they don't really realize that that's what they're experiencing because that's just how they felt their pretty much their entire lives like they don't know anything different but really it's when somebody appears to have it all together from the outside but they're kind of crumbling <laughs> internally so to speak um you know a lot of people are going to be really successful 
they're going to be able to to kind of juggle you know work and maybe being a parent and um managing the household and you know it just from the outside it, it looks like they have their their stuff together and that you know they're they're on top of everything but internally it's that um just constantly like doubting themselves or questioning themselves and um getting stuck in the doing right a, a lot of our self-worth comes from what we can do versus who we are and so it just kind of creates the, or perpetuates the cycle of doing more and doing more and doing more and then you know we'll achieve something and not really give ourselves time to relish in it and then it's on to the next so so it's sort of like I, I call it like the finish line mentality where you know we have an achievement feels feels okay and then we we're just on to the next achievement and we never really give ourselves time to like you know reflect on on what we've done and what we've been able to accomplish and um so it really just kind of robs us of of our happiness yeah, it's so true. I, I I can definitely relate to that. It's almost that like the hollowness, like you thought you would feel a certain way. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you don't. And you're like, well, what's wrong with me? Why don't I why am I not grateful for this? Or why does it not? Yeah. Like I thought it would. And then you feel like you have to keep going and going and going. But it's so true. It's like, I don't know. Uh, could you like this is something I've experienced with many people I've worked with too. Like it's like you almost don't want to celebrate your wins because it's almost like taking the foot off the gas. Mm-hmm. Like can you explain that a little bit? Why, why is that a thing? Because there's like a fear, I feel like in Mm -hmm. like, if you celebrate yourself, you're going to let off and then everything's going to like spiral out of control. Yeah. Cause it's, you know, that, that anxiety is like fuel and and it kind of keeps us going, but, but not in a healthy way. And so it's like, if we, if we do allow ourselves to slow down, we think that we're going to become complacent or we're going to, you know, if we're juggling a million things, we're going to drop, drop one of those balls or, or not sort of reach our full potential when in reality, it's like slowing down and, um, reflecting on those accomplishments or giving ourselves space to rest and recharge is what's actually going to make us be more successful and, and happier in the future. But we have a really hard time when we're just, I mean, it's, it's habitual. It's like how we're wired unless we really are intentional about, um, breaking that, that cycle that it's just going to keep going and going. Yeah. It's so true. It's like, you go back to what's most familiar, what's most comfortable. And even if it doesn't serve you, it's like that you perpetually go back to that person because Mm -hmm. you've lived like that for years and maybe didn't even realize that you're living for years. So yeah, I've definitely experienced that in my life. And I'm sure many people listening are like, yes, (laughs) like Mm -hmm that I've experienced that too. For someone who is saying, yes, that's me. Like, how do I break that cycle? Like, what is something that someone could do today to, to get started, to start moving out of that, that vicious cycle? I think it's, you know, that cycle is sort of fed by external validation and, um, sort of external rewards, so to speak. So I think, we often look for more of that, right? We we look for more things outside of ourselves to try to make us happy or or try to to be fulfilled. And so I think really just starting to look inward is the first step, you know, and and you can do that just by by like creating the time to be reflective. You can do that through meditating. You can there you know, books out there, uh, you can see a therapist or however, however you want to do that. It's just kind of really giving yourself the space to look inward, um, to see, okay, why, why am I doing all of this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a really good recommendation because it is like having that space and that time and realizing that it is that time where things actually happen and you move forward is, is huge. And Mm -hmm. I know we just jumping back to something you said too, like with the limiting beliefs, limiting beliefs right below the surface. So much of our lives, we don't even realize yeah, that we're hearing right. them. How do we start to uncover that? Cause that can be really tricky. I remember when I started like working through mine, I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't even know where to begin. Like, isn't this yeah. how everyone thinks? Isn't this how everyone feels? So like I normalize so many things that I experience. like how, uh-huh. how do you start to uncover some of those things that maybe are dictating your life, but are not serving you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I kind of call them our blind spots. So just like, you know, if you're in a car and you have a blind spot, that's the, you can't see that area. Like we, there's like, you're saying there's so much that lies sort of below 
our level of conscious awareness that um, they're, they're blind spots. And we all have them, even if we've done like, you know, a lot of work on ourselves, we, we all have blind spots. So sometimes it actually takes someone else to give you that feedback that like, hey, I'm, I'm kind of noticing this pattern in, in your belief systems or the way you're thinking. Um, and so that's what I spend a lot of time doing with, with my therapy clients is really kind of looking for, for those patterns and limiting beliefs, or, um, sometimes we can, we call them cognitive distortions. So if somebody wants to kind of do their own research, if you just Google up cognitive distortions, um, you'll get a lot of examples of certain types of, um, patterns of thinking that that can really kind of contribute to um some of those self-sabotaging types of behaviors yeah that's that's really good and just having that terminology like something that you can really put some you know uh, make it a little more tangible because like you can feel this mm-hmm. way but like having that to look at be like oh yeah this is what i'm experiencing now it just allows you to move forward in it a little bit more mm-hmm. yeah. and i know um you you've talked about burnout and burnout's a big thing especially when you're trying to juggle all these things. You're trying to be a mom, a businesswoman, you know, whatever it is, there's a lot going on. What are some of those signs that you've noticed that someone could really see if they're starting to burn out before they actually get to the point of burnout? Yeah. So I think sp- specifically for people who are high achieving, it's when that, that sense of like apathy starts to rear its ugly head. Cause you know, you're, you're kind of constantly in this state of hypervigilance and and going and almost like fight or flight um, state. And then when, when you're, when you're on the cusp of burnout, you're like, it's something switches where you kind of get this sense of apathy. You might be unmotivated. You might be really tired or start to feel a little bit depressed or, or hopeless. Um, So those are definitely warning signs that that burnout might be on its way yeah no that's really good to look for because again you may sometimes I notice people experience that and then they're like oh what's wrong with me that rather than realizing like this is a symptom of something that bigger Mm -hmm. is going on so it's really good to have that awareness because then you can look inside yourself like am I this am I this like Mm -hmm. and now you can seek out appropriate help to so that you don't get to the point where like everything is just at the burnout level yeah yeah, yeah. It's hard to come back from. So yeah, absolutely. Is much easier. hundred percent. No, it absolutely is. And one thing, like, especially for sometimes with people who are high achievers, you know, that perfectionist mindset is like n- not even taking the moment to like recognize that, like recognize those mm-hmm. signs because they, it's almost like when we are in this hustle culture, those things are yeah. praised. Absolutely. Can you talk about how society plays a huge role in this? Because like inside ourselves, we can maybe see this, but then when we're getting rewarded, like maybe at work mm-hmm. or from just how society praises, just constantly going, staying busy, how do we navigate that with like ourselves versus like what we're being rewarded for outside ourselves? Yeah. It's so, it's so hard because it's, it's worked for us, right? <laughs> like it, mm-hmm. it's gotten yeah. us where, where we are in life, mm-hmm. which is, is to be pretty successful for most yeah. high achievers. And so it's really hard to take a step back and be like, but, but is this really good? Like, is this sustainable rather, you know? Um, and yeah, I think there are so many systemic issues that contribute and, um, there's such this competition in sort of the corporate world of, you know, if you if you're a workaholic, if you are, uh, it's almost like this, um, competition for who who works more or who who yeah. got like the least amount of sleep or mm-hmm. you know and it's yeah. it's not good it's like um if we're all sort of trapped in this mentality then we just kind of feed off of each other so it's it just adds another layer of complexity i think when you're trying to get out of this um and i i think just kind of practicing self compassion and acceptance that like comparing yourself to other people that you work with or, or other, just anyone, friends, family, whomever, you know, um, that it's, that really doesn't matter because eventually they're going to experience burnout or they're going to be, you know, they're just probably living miserable lives. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot going on behind closed doors that, that we don't necessarily see. Um, 
we only see that one kind of what that one side of of their experience so really to try not to compare but just um again go inward and and figure out like all right well if i have to if i can't perform at 110 percent, what am i okay with you know um mm-hmm. in order to just feel better overall yeah it's a really good point too plus bringing it back to what you said earlier it's like you're showing the world one version of yourself but you know how you're feeling to a yeah. version of yourself so everybody else is doing that too, but you're seeing the good version of themselves. Yeah. <laughs> you're not seeing the behind closed doors when they're like crying, exhausted, like edgy, you know, like yes, absolutely. You, know, you only see that within yourself, but then you think everyone else has it together. It's like mm-hmm. everyone who's in that culture is experiencing that. It's just how good are they, how good are they at like showing that version of themselves or not? Yeah. So yeah, yeah mm-hmm. no, it's, it's a great I point. Didn't interrupt. Oh no, it's all right. And Going off of that, just because talking about society, like how much do you think like social media contributes to that? Because there's always that curated version. Like we're only seeing oh, yeah. again, one side of the story and now we see it at work. You know, people are performing. Now we're seeing social media. Everybody seems like to have it together. Yeah. How, how does that all contribute to create kind of a bigger mess in all this? Oh, it's a, it's a huge mess. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a highlight reel mm-hmm. of people's lives. And again, you're just seeing like, a glimpse, you know, of, of what they want you to see. So it's very specifically curated. And when we compare their highlight reel against, you know, our lived experiences, a lot of the time that, that don't feel very good. Um, it, it can just exacerbate those, those feelings of anxiety or depression or low self-esteem or, um, imposter syndrome, you know, what, whatever someone's, dealing with. So I think it's, it's so challenging because social media can be beneficial in so many ways, but then it can also be so harmful and it's designed to give you that dopamine hit that makes you feel good. That makes you want to keep scrolling. Right. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, unless we're sort of monitoring ourselves or setting boundaries Mm -hmm. with our social media use, um, a lot of times we don't realize the impact that it has until we take like a social media break. And I've had clients do that, you know, they'll take a week off or or take the apps off their phone and only go on on their computer or hide the app at like on the last page of their phone so that they have to really kind of go through some extra steps to access it. So they're they're It gives them the space and time to think like, all right, is this really what I want to be doing right now? Because now it's like, it's, reflexive right it's just like yeah. so automatic to, mm-hmm. to grab our phones yeah no it's totally true and i, I think it the nail on the head like that dopamine effects and it's like these companies are paying millions of dollars for people to figure out how to keep you on the app because that's yeah. how it's made so it's yeah. like we're fighting against something that is big you know so mm-hmm. i think it's a great suggestion to like literally give yourself a moment away so you can have some clarity and be like, is this serving me? Is this actually like helping me feel good about myself or is it not? Because mm-hmm. it is that it is that very much like automatic. You pick up your phone and it's like, before you know it, your thumbs on Instagram or your thumbs yeah. on Facebook, you're, you've then five minutes goes by 10 minutes. It's like, yeah, it's mm-hmm. amazing how much it does suck you in. Even if you feel like you, you have a good grip on it, it tends mm-hmm. to really pull people in. So yeah, yeah, no, it's a good, good suggestion to like remove yourself so you can really see that more clearly. Mm-hmm. And I know you, you just, you talked about imposter syndrome. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Cause that is such a big thing for anybody who's like trying to create a newer life for themselves, or they're trying to move into that maybe discomfort, uncomfortable zone where like it's unfamiliar. Mm-hmm. They're trying to really grow and evolve, but then there's like, well, who am I to do this? <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So can you talk about that? Cause that can be really hindering to someone who maybe has the awareness, they're not content where they are, they're Mm -hmm. trying to expand themselves, but then there's like that pause, that that something that's holding them back. And a lot of times it is that imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. So just, uh, you know, expanding on that and how that really impacts people. Yeah, and it's so ironic because so many people experience it, you know, but it's Mm -hmm. it's like this sense that we're going to be found out, that like we're not as intelligent or competent or skilled as other people think we are. Um, and that that's somehow we're going to be exposed, you know, and a lot of that just comes back to, um, just our, our sense of, of self-worth. And also I think just how, um, 
again, social messages, like especially for women, women definitely struggle with imposter syndrome a bit more than men do. And, um, and it's become really rampant. I think social media plays a role because now we just have access to, to seeing, you know, what other people are doing. And, um, again, we're only seeing a, a glimpse into a, a portion of their lives, but, um, there's a, a quote that I, I actually have it on my wall right here. So I keep looking mm-hmm. over. I can't, I, I don't know who the author is, so mm-hmm. I, I don't know who to give credit to, but it's, yeah. um, it's scary because it's unfamiliar, not because you're incapable. Mm-hmm. And I love that yeah. because I think a lot yeah. of times we, especially with imposter syndrome, we get anxious because we think we're incapable or, you know, we don't have, um, the, the intelligence or the skills when in reality it's, it's new. So of course it's going to be unfamiliar. Of course it's going to be a learning curve, you know? Yeah. hundred percent. Um, I love that quote. Yeah. I'll have to write that down myself. Cause I, I love that. And that's such a good reminder. Cause even if you know that it's so important to remember that, cause there's always going to be something else that's uncomfortable that you yeah. think yeah. is a lack of you, but it's really just something new. And it's like, at what point does that change? You know, like as kids, we learn to walk, that's totally unfamiliar, but we mm-hmm. do it anyway. Yeah. And as adults, every, things are unfamiliar and we think that we're incapable yet we learned how to walk and crawl and stand mm-hmm. and do all these things. It's like, we're amazing, but we just forget how amazing we are. Like, yeah. 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 We don't overanalyze everything when we're, when we're <laughs> yes. infants, right? So that's so true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know we need to bring that back to ourselves. Totally. Again. Yeah. Totally. And, and that's, yeah. what's, what's amazing about kids. It's like, they are their authentic self, you yeah. know, they're trying to like grow two versions of themselves. They only have right. to worry about the one. And it's like, if we can get back to that as adults, yeah we would be so powerful and not have mm-hmm. to feel like we always have to put on a show for everything. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that, you know, that's a, it, it just made me think of um, something else where like the role of play in our lives is so mm-hmm. important. And as adults, we don't really consider that, you know, everything is responsibility or obligation mm-hmm. and, and play can, can be whatever form, you know, it could be doing something creative or, mm-hmm. um, really anything that, that yeah. is sort of restorative for, for you, your, you know, mental, emotional, physical energy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, and that's what kids do, right. They play mm-hmm. all the time and they're, they're so much better off emotional for it. <laughs> exactly and there's a lot of research showing that play helps you rewire the brain and yeah it's explorative curiosity of learning yeah. something mm-hmm. that you don't know and it's like kids are so great at this and like we yeah we get stuck in, in such a rut you know yeah same thing going to the seat that's familiar going driving the path that's familiar we keep mm-hmm. going back to everything we know and it's yeah you're so right if we can start incorporating some of those things that are just fun like mm-hmm. and just like have fun. I think sometimes as adults, especially like, you know, high achievers, go-getters, like there's yeah. almost that guilt, like, oh, I don't have time to do this. Like this mm-hmm. is so irresponsible. I should, I should be doing the dishes while I have this time or, yeah. you know, the pile of clothes on my bed. Like there feels like there's also guilt response too. sometimes. Oh, like, huge guilt. Yeah. When you know, self-care guilt, fun guilt, play guilt, like it yeah. all comes in. And then even if you still do the play, but you're thinking that guilt thoughts, mm-hmm. it's like, it doesn't help you at all. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. yeah. How, how, like, how do you break that? A little, like for someone who's like, yeah, that's me. Like I still do the self-care. I'm just going through the motions. I'm doing everything I should. Mm-hmm. How do you start to transition to like, I'm doing this because I want to versus like, they told me I should do this. I should do this. You know? <laughs> yeah. like, it's another obligation that that's I'm it. You're just adding, adding to your list. List. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it's a tough, it's a tough one. You know, I think that's, um, in this case, it's really helpful to explore those limiting beliefs that are contributing to the feeling of guilt. You know, what are the stories that we tell ourselves about re- resting or um, taking time for self-care? You know, why, where's that guilt coming from, especially as as a mom? Um, you know, there's so much mom guilt and sort of this, these societal messages that we should self-sacrifice. Um, and so I think this, like, kind of our generation of, of moms are, are shifting that, but there are still some, some deep seated, um, messages and, and beliefs that, that are there. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, Um, absolutely. I totally agree with that. It's like, you you see what's modeled when we grew up and it was that mm self-sacrifice. You're like, well, this is how you do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We wouldn't want our kids to self-sacrifice. So why are we doing that ourselves? It's like literally a gift to your kid when you actually do take time for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's so important to reframe that because it it really, it can be really hard to get stuck in those traps. And like, even if you know that it's still easy to get stuck in those Mm -hmm. traps. of Like I shouldn't do this. I I don't have this 15 minutes. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah. It, it can be really a vicious cycle of never feeling like anything is for you or you can mm-hmm. never uh, put gas in your tank. It always has to be, yeah. it drains you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I think just accepting that the, as adults, like our to-do list will never be complete ever. Yeah. Like that just doesn't exist, you yeah. know? So <laughs> when we, when we're constantly in this like go, go, go mentality and sure there, there are a million things you could be doing, but does that mean you should be doing them? Probably not, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and really just being intentional about choosing and again, scheduling it like, okay, this is my, whether it's five minutes or an hour, you know, um, this is my time to, for me that I, I'm using to, to recharge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's so important for the mentality of it too. If like if you've been working all day and you know, at two o'clock, that's your scheduled time to take a break. It's like, mm-hmm. I think even just your brain has that like lets off that fear response a little bit it's like yeah it knows that it's going to be taken care of but if it doesn't know it's going to be taken care of it it just yells louder it seems like you know it's just mm-hmm. more of those things go on versus like when you schedule it it knows that okay i'm i'm gonna have a reprieve it's built yeah. into the schedule mm-hmm. so yeah it makes such a difference and such a good suggestion too because that often is the first thing that goes when you have a busy day or things get overwhelming yes. it's like yeah. well that's just self-care time. I don't need to do that. You know, it's like, unfortunately it doesn't become one of those non-negotiables and it really needs to be. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, and that it's going to feel weird and selfish and riddled with guilt, you know, when Mm -hmm. we start doing it, but like once something becomes a habit, then it's a lot easier to, to keep it going. So Mm -hmm. I think just like embracing that too, that yeah, it is going to feel selfish mm-hmm. and, it, and you will have guilt when, when you start and that's normal. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. yeah. And if you plan for it, you know, mm-hmm. then now again, you're, you're already anticipating that and you can kind of work that in versus like, oh my gosh, I thought this was supposed to be helpful. It's yeah. It's, right. Got off guard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, it's, there's so many amazing points here, but it's like, hopefully for anyone who's listening, this really helps serve you. If, if you're feeling like you're trapped and you're stuck and you don't know what to do mm-hmm. and you're overwhelmed and just really start to rewire your brain in a way that changes how you think about things. And that's really what it is. It's like the perception in which you view life is, is really where this, this comes from. And, and yeah. Yeah. And, and and again, like you said, the limiting beliefs that are creating that perception, you know? Mm -hmm. So once you start to bring awareness of that, that, that's, it can really be a game changer. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For someone who wanted to work with you and maybe dive deeper into those limiting beliefs and what they're dealing with, how can they find you? Um, so my website is Cathartic Space Counseling. That's the name of my practice. Um, and I'm I'm licensed as a therapist in uh, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Florida. Um, mm-hmm. But then I also have coaching clients nationwide um, that, you know, we work on, on similar things. There are certain licensure guidelines, obviously, um, between therapy and coaching, but, um, but I do work with people nationwide as well. Great. I'll put everything in the show notes too, for anyone who's listening and wants to reach out to Kristen, definitely do that and and follow her and just dive in deeper into everything that can really help you move your life forward. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me. Yes. Thank you. And again, for anyone listening, if you found value in this, share it with somebody who also might find value in this. You never know when something, you know, a a certain message hits them and just transforms their life. So Mm -hmm. thank you again. And thank you for everyone who listened today.